Thank you. So I tried to try to get her in the last Well, and I could be in the middle and I can take care of the computer and move the slides as you guys want them. Oh, okay. oh you can just move the computer so yeah. after Phil finishes. Sure. Sure. Just stop that? No, it's for something. Yeah, yeah maybe I'll just put it there and yeah. maybe there's enough. Yeah, maybe there's enough of the projection to the screen. So, anyway, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our second conversation uh, of the, this academic year. Uh, my name is Zorica Nedovic Budic, for those who I haven't met so far. Uh, I'm a department head and also a professor of spatial planning and spatial technologies here in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy. Uh, we're uh, building um, uh, a new program that is actually stimulating all these new discussions. We're building a degree uh, and launching a degree in a Master of Urban of uh, City Design. Uh, that has uh, kind of stimulated all kinds of new interesting uh, conversations and this is one of them. Uh, it is important when we're launching a degree and have an educational, professional education program also to couple that with intellectual development and the kind of dialogues that go between the scholars and professionals and the practitioners in how to enhance our understanding of the field. So this is really the purpose of this particular um, uh, of the series of event, events. This is actually our fourth event. We talked about sustainable nation with Doug Farr. Uh, we talked about how we can enhance the patterns and use the patterns of design to understand cities at various scales. Uh, we talked about Jerusalem a couple of weeks ago and how ideology of people designing cities interacting with political environment. We had our first conversation uh, in the spring of, uh, in the fall uh, of this academic year with actually Emily Talent who is here with us and also of University of Chicago and Asim Inan from University of Cardiff. So again, we're really pleased that we're taking the opportunity of opening a new degree to also open a new conversation of understanding and enhancing the field and actually bringing up these dilemmas or kind of the new ideas and, and, and thoughts about how we uh, both from the academic side but also from the practice side 
can uh, move this forward and that would all connect to our students, to our instructors, to the scholars who are studying um, cities and city design. So again, it's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm passing on to the program director, Sanjeev Vidyarthi, who will introduce our um, uh, esteemed guests for today and start the conversation. Uh, welcome you all. Thank you, Zaritza. Um, it's a pleasure to, to introduce the two um, uh, distinguished speakers today. Um, um, and sort of, um, um, as Zoritza mentioned, um, series of conversations leading to the launch of the MCD program in, in, in the fall of this year. Um, to my right is uh, uh, Phil Enquist. Uh, people usually take the name, uh, so if you say Chicago and city design, people in the same breath would mention, have you spoken to Phil Enquist? And that's not a joke. We, Zoritza and I sort of encountered it, talking to a range of people as we went out to do an outreach for, for this new degree. Um, Phil has been a long-term Chicagoan now, he, uh, since 1981, uh, when he started working with SOM, where he's a partner um, uh, in, in the city design practice and sort of doing city design initiatives and projects uh, all over the world. He mentioned 100 cities uh, where SOM you know, has sort of done. Uh, this kind of work, uh, but at, at the very heart, Phil is a synthesizer. So he sort of brings together de various disciplines, um, regional planning, uh, landscape, um, uh, architectural design, uh, city design, city planning, and sort of working through across spatial scales. So right from regional, <coughs> one of his more prominent projects was sort of designing a plan for the Great uh, Lakes region. Um, and then, then uh, uh, urban redevelopment projects in more inner city uh, uh, settings. But a progressive designer, and he's also a thinker and, and a teacher, has been involved with, with teaching at many places. And on my left is uh, Professor Rahul Mehrotra, who is, uh, uh, who is a full professor at uh, the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. Um, he started his practice in Bombay almost 30 years ago. Um, more than 100 projects uh, in various urban settings and more than a dozen books. Raul had his exhibition in the entrance lobby of GSD a couple years ago and I happened to show up and it's a marvelous body of work, right? More than a dozen books and, and, and almost 100 projects. Like the word 100, 100 cities. 100. I like the notion of 100 tonight. Right? So the, um, nonetheless, so these two, Google them. Rahul Mehrotra or Google Phil Enquist, and then you would come across. Uh, uh, don't, don't Google me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but at this point in time, I'd like to stop the introductions, right? So these two progressive designers, um, and we know the world looks different from different places. And that, I think, is, is the motive, motive for tonight. The, it looks very different if you're looking at the world from Shanghai or you, when you're looking at it from Dhaka, or you're looking at it from one of the smaller settlements mm -hmm. in the Midwest. And the two speakers bring these very enriching perspectives of having seen the world from different vantages, from different perspectives uh, to, the, to the table here. Um, and, and that's sort of the theme of, of the conversation as to what is the future of city design practice as, as we stand at this urbanizing moment where more than half of the human population now lives in cities, and people all over the world sort of uh, look for a better quality of life in these urban places. Um, so the layout of the evening is uh, I'll invite both them one by one to sort of uh, show a few slides um, and explain their own perspective in less than three minutes, at most four. Three to four minutes, they lay out what, what, what should they take on this topic. And from then, we'll open it to a discussion um, between three of us and in about 30 minutes open it up for a more substantial discussion and question and answer with the audience. So Phil, what's, what's your take? Okay, I get to go first. Okay. Oh, I have to get started. My time is ticking. Uh, first, a uh, few things. It's nice to see uh, people in the audience I've worked with before. So Steve uh, Friedman, a brilliant economist, in Chicago, we've worked with on a number of projects like the Glenview Naval Air Station, and then former employees, Farhat Zareen, uh, who is just a great uh, urban designer planner here in Chicago. So thank you for coming. And 
Uh, you didn't mention Sanjeev Raul and I taught uh, a class together at University of Michigan many years ago that was on uh, Detroit and uh, it was a really wonderful project to be looking at cities and uh, it's hard to talk about them in three minutes. But uh, what I thought I would do is just talk about one aspect. Uh, so when we talk about the future city, uh, we know we, we're facing uh, phenomenal urban migration across the planet due to either political issues or climate issues. We're looking at dramatic climate change. Just in our own country in the last year, we've seen North Carolina flood at the scale of a state. We've seen uh, the state of California burn, and now we've seen multiple states in the mid Midwest flood. And it's it's pretty shocking what's happening to, to regions, and, and we're realizing, I think, that cities are not really prepared for this kind of intense uh, climate challenge. And we're also seeing a tremendous loss of wildlife habitat uh, across the planet. We're also, I think, in the world of cities facing very exciting tipping points. Uh, yeah, sure. In energy, health, mobility, but I wanted to just start with some, these slides could be anywhere. Uh, this happens to be Denver, but uh, we inherit these cities uh, with this sort of grid infrastructure that allows us a framework for infill and growth and reinvestment. If you go to the next uh, slide, but this is the same place. But it's an impervious world and it's, it's it works at certain levels, but it really fails at other levels. This kind of city building does not promote uh, ecology. It doesn't promote wildlife. Uh, it's an impervious ground <coughs> plane. We separate rainfall from the aquifer. We put everything in pipes and we use water to move waste away. And you can also, I mean, this could be anywhere, right? This could be Chicago, this could be Orlando, Atlanta, it happens to be Denver. Uh, but it also isn't really a place for people. It's been engineered for cars. The result uh, is that we end up with fragmented ecologies. We end up with uh, uh, intense uh, nutrients or pesticides in our water systems uh, as sort of one issue. This is my planet exploding moment and we'll work our way out of this. Uh, the other thing we were seeing uh, as last year in Paris, uh, intense flooding of the Seine uh, due to the way they have engineered their river for agriculture. Uh, and uh, also related to water and energy, there's a strong overlap between coal-fired power plants and energy and water. So in this particular statement, uh, you see 55 to 75 trillion gallons of fresh water are used annually in the process of coal-fired power plants. So the way we <laughs> build our cities, create our energy, the way we move people is all rather damaging to ecology. So I thought the one thing I would focus on in my four minutes is how cities can be greener. Because at the same time, we're looking at tremendous urban growth uh, if we look out to 2050, as we reach over 9 billion people, we have cities that are major cities uh, that are really planning phenomenal growth. So uh, this great quote I love, the future will be green or not at all. And I think we have to shift gears in how we think about not just ourselves and our built environment, but how we accommodate all living things on a planet. This satellite photo is, is, to me, an indication of new tools we have or may have where we can look at the scale of the planet. This is overlapping cities in growth modes with highly sensitive ecological zones. And if our cities are allowed to grow, they destroy the most sensitive ecological zones on the planet. So how do you start to bring these data centers together this uh, drawing is more at the city scale of a redevelopment of an inner city airport where the plan was really to give half of this land back to nature to filter the nutrients out of the water uh, and create a cleaner water system for the city of, this is Kunming uh, in China. 
Uh, and this is in Chicago where, as many of you maybe know, there's been a lot of efforts on the Chicago River, an industrialized steel-lined river to look at how to soften it, bring wildlife back, improve the water quality of industrialized riverways uh, that many cities suffer from. And then the last, the smallest scale is just really maybe a different uh, slightly different urban form where we see more intense mix of use. We see maybe food growing uh, within inner cities. We see uh, commitment to shaded environments that naturally cool urban, urban uh, environments along with uh, integrating uh, natural systems. So this quote, just to end my three minutes, is really uh, interesting. It's by David Grinspoon, a scientist. He wrote a book called Earth in Human Hands. And he says, we need visions for the future where we have embraced our role as planet shapers. And I think it's very interesting for the design community to see themselves as more informed <coughs> planet shapers. We are, whether we intend to or not, we're shaping the planet with our impact. But if we can bring science and design together in, in more sort of convergence research, uh, I think we can design in a smarter way. So uh, for the enhancement of all life on Earth. So that's, that's my uh, three minutes. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Phil. Wow. <laughs> that's fantastic. No, I'm going to. Yeah, that's inspiration for you, Raul, right now. <clears throat> well, ben, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's almost impossible, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, no, I sort of, uh, Phil, thank you for that. And I think you kind of uh, bring in this question of inclusion, which is something that I think is also one of the challenges for uh, urban design or city design. I'm sorry if I use these titles interchangeably. I'm more used to using urban design. Uh, but all, So I think the idea of inclusion is going to be one of the big challenges. And I think, at least in my own definition, I see urban design, city design, as being, um, as being a bridge practice because you kind of have the abstraction of planning and you have the site specificity of architecture. Uh, and really, city design and urban design becomes a bit, bri bridge practice. And it intrinsically becomes about advocacy because it is about creating feedback loops between these different scales and obsessions. But also, the practice of these bridge disciplines and planning, in its broadest sense, has to be about the public. Uh, and uh, I think whether it's the role of the state, which we are all despairing about, you can't have planning or city design uh, without the state. And you have acute privatization today, which has been part of the problem. I think, Phil, we were discussing earlier how the mentality of a developer of maximizing just to make up for the high land value they've already paid off, uh, extends to the, the scale of the city. And then, of course, common good gets sacrificed. And so what does privatization mean? And I think for me, this is a really interesting map because it shows you the kind of disjuncture between resources and paradigms. And no, it's no coincidence why, where the borders are the hardest, because that's where you have to hold them. But I think I use this more to make the point that the paradigms of the, of the affluent are being transferred quite mindlessly on the non-affluent. Uh, and so it's also a problem of the paradigms in urban design. Because I think urban design, unfortunately, or city design, they, the, 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 the idea of the absolute solution is something that we've been overwhelmed with and we've been embracing. And how do you design for transitions, which is what we need, which is a whole completely different approach uh, to design. And so I call this the architecture or the urban scapes of impatient capital. Uh, and so uh, you, you begin to celebrate those terrains which allow the frictionless arrival of capital. So suddenly Dubai, Shanghai, uh, many of these city states almost sort of become the kind of paradigms then that get exported uh, around the world. And so the opposite the opposite of this is designing for transitions, I, I use here the, just the case of Medellin, where it's about small interventions that open up connections and they open up the possibilities to facilitate the transition of these environments. And so I think imagining, speculating about the transitions is one of the big challenges that I think city design should begin to embrace because I think there's a limit to these absolute solutions. And I think 
for me, everything Philip, uh, Phil uh, highlighted and articulated as problems come out of these kinds of absolute solutions and using them as right. paradigms uh, which get superimposed. And so this is really the dichotomy between the city as big architecture and the city as socioeconomic planning, which we really need to resolve. So if you actually map this as a graph and you put you know, architecture, uh, kind of big architecture, city, and city as socioeconomic, uh, planning on these, and you begin to look at time, you, you get a very interesting wave which begins to flatten as we come along. So when urban design and city design is first invented and there's city renewal and all of that, modernism, it's architecture as big city, or as city design. And then you have a reaction to that which becomes participatory, process-oriented, planning begins to take over. Then you have postmodernism; it flattens a bit. And exactly for the challenges that Phil is describing, bringing the ecological thinking into this, this graph is going to flatten very much. Where you're going to, I mean, we have to aspire towards collapsing these two processes. And that's where I think bridge disciplines like city design, urban design become really uh, critical. So I see uh, three or four critical issues uh, that we, I think, need to deal with, that we should bring into the debate of both planning as well as city design. One is this sort of resolution between absolute and transitionary thinking and resolving this sort of uh, uh, dichotomy that we kind of uh, have out there. The second is I think we need to recognize the condition of flux that our cities are in. I think we are often designing permanent problems for, temp I mean, we are designing uh, uh, permanent solutions for temporary problems through these absolute solutions. And what does flux mean? I mean, just if I look at India and my current research, and Sanjeev has worked on this too, uh, recently his last book. I mean, actually in India, you could argue India is 60% urban for six months of the year and, you know, 40% urban for the other six months of the year. So you have 300 million people in flux because they're going back, they're mobile. And so how do you design cities for that? And I think coming out of that, we've got to take temporal landscapes, we've got to take the notion of time much more seriously. And temporality is something that hasn't infected the debate of city design and urban planning and urban design I believe uh, enough, and I think that's going to be uh, one of the big challenges that we uh, kind of uh, have to, uh, I think, address and find ways uh, of addressing. And I think just to loop back to Phil's arguments, I think the environment, nature, uh, and looking at ecology in its broadest sort of sense might give us the critical clues in imagining these what I would call holding strategies to make the transition uh, that this planet is making. Uh, between whether we occupy the hot spots with our cities or we find other places yeah. and how we do that and how light our footprint is on the planet. So thanks. Thanks. Um, so for the students, you can accomplish a lot, three to four minutes, right? I mean, we have the two positions out here very clear. Um, uh, and I'll turn to Phil first. Uh, within, within Academia, Phil, so we have had this, this very long tradition of environmental thinking. So for example, I'm thinking Louis Mumford and regional planning, um, uh, the Regional Planning Association of America, right? the 1920s uh, plan for, for the New York region. Um, has this green urbanism thinking sort of filtered down to mainstream, or what you're showing us was the aspiration? No, I don't think it has. I, I don't think. Uh, it has found its way into uh, uh, local uh, community law in a way that really affects settlement patterns. I think especially at regional levels, I think there are very few areas that express a regional brilliance. Uh, I just came from a four-day conference in Phoenix last week and I was literally shocked to hear that their long-range plan is to double the current footprint of the Phoenix region, which is already so unbelievably huge. And when you drive through the older parts of Phoenix, you see just block after block after block of underutilized land, and there's no reason to continue to expand. And yet, I think when you 
especially in the United States, I think when you get into larger regions where you've got city against city, uh, county against county, you, you don't see a regional brilliance that guides growth. And I, I think we're lacking the tools we need to keep, I mean, what, what Raul said about cities reflecting a flexibility, almost like they can shrink when they need to, they can expand when they need to. That doesn't work when you're building at two to four units per acre. Uh, and Detroit is a great example of that a huge land area built at a very low density and then when they lose their population you have these fragments left over. I think we need planning law today that that I think encourages much more flexibility in the mix of uses. Uh, to separate uh, commercial and residential uses doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, the more we can mix use, the more we can build at higher densities, the more we can build at walkable scales, uh, maybe then the less we sprawl. How do we control cities from sprawling or regions from sprawling? I don't see the tools in place for that. <clears throat> so it's interesting talking to planners about this because you could debate that with me, but I just don't see the tools to, to protect larger regions without major sort of grassroots nonprofit initiatives to step forward and protect specific landscapes. Mm -hmm. which, is, um, which is interesting because if there, is, there is sort of almost a, um, a, a unanimous consensus within the, CAD, within the academic world and Emily Talon sort of bears testimony, uh, her whole work, 25 years, everything you said, uh, and then the mainstream practice, right? I mean, if it, this comes from, from someone like you, uh, the designers are sensitive to it, but, but, the, but the local laws don't support it. So that's more of a public policy or a political issue than, than a design or a planning issue. Well, um, <laughs> the technology, I think, is helping. Uh, somebody explained to me, and I don't know if this is true, but it was an interesting theory that the re why is Fulton Market suddenly so successful in this vibrant, intense transformation? And somebody said it's due to Uber and Lyft technology, that this was an area that wasn't that easy to get into or out of, and now it's very easy to get into and out of, and the, without worrying about parking, uh, due to Lyft and Ubers, you can get in there and get out, uh, and suddenly, I mean, there are a lot of other reasons too, but I thought that was kind of interesting that this technology uh, was like a, a, a kickstarter for uh, Fulton Market to change. But cities are densifying. We're seeing, an, I think we're seeing an, an urbanization trend across America in cities where people are wanting to come back together. People are wanting to be in more walkable or bikeable urban environments, this is good. Uh, and we can maybe shift from the last 75 years of building based on the automobile. Now, uh, shifting gears a little bit. So Rahul, uh, based on the three or four major points that you made, uh, uh, what do you think are some of the more concrete design solutions that we should be pursuing um, in light of what you said um, and how? I'm thinking of more specific examples. For example, if I have to design for uh, transitory cities, right, where there's a flux of people in and out, can you think of an example, or would you like to elaborate on that point a little bit? Well, I mean, I think fundamentally in city design and urban design in its classic sense, we've made architecture too much of the central instrument by which the city is organized. That already begins to lock you into all sorts of inflexibilities. Uh, and so the question is, and you know, I mean, again, Phil's uh, um, uh, presentation alluded a lot to it, is what are the other domains that can actually help you uh, inform or can nourish thinking about what, are, you know, what sets up the parameters for the form of the city? 
uh, it need yeah. not be only architecture. I mean, of course, architecture can be incredibly instrumental to create the densities, to create robust forms, but it's been too central, uh, the instrument. And so therefore, that has implications on zoning, it has implications on land use, it has implications on, you know, uh, what you reserve land for changing uses. We reserve open spaces for parks. That's actually quite static in the way we even imagine open space. Uh, and so can you have, uh, on a temporal scale, uh, different kinds of uses allowed, you know? Uh, 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 I mean, you know, even just the farmer's market, which has become such a phenomena, it, it always surprised me. I always said, you know, share this story when I first moved to teach in Ann Arbor. My kids came back from school, they were 12, 10 and 12, and they came back excited because the school had taken them to the farmer's market. And I said, like, you've, you know, they said, you've got to go and see, you've got to come with us to the farmer's market. I said, you've forgotten our whole cities like the farmer's market, <laughs> which is Mumbai, where we came from. <laughs> and so the idea of suddenly bringing this temporality into what is otherwise yeah. a static city, which creates different kinds of human interactions, connections, uh, body space, all of that. I mean, we need more space for that, you know? So how do you, that's, I agree completely. Uh, how do you set up governance for that? I mean, how do you, like, encourage that to happen? Because we do over-prescribe, over-program, right. and things end up very static. Right. No, and so that's why, I mean, I think, the global south, and that's why I had that first map I started with, why are we only using paradigms that come out of conditions of affluence which use architecture, yeah. architecture instrumentally to organize the space? I mean, I was recently at Warwick Junction in Durban, and it is the most incredibly managed market and is done by civil society NGOs. Uh, and you know they have, for example, a system where they have platforms off the sidewalk where there's a lottery system. So hawkers are regulated, which you otherwise think will be chaotic. Yeah. They've bought it mainstream into the governance system where they have the kind of dynamic turnover of vendors, they have zoning within that where certain kinds of producers can be, so and this is a large scale market. Or if you look at Mexico City, those parking lots sometimes have 50,000 vendors on weekends. It's managed by the state and the city in that case. And they accept that those temporal landscapes are, now these are happening sort of in the interstitial spaces by default and governments are accommodating. And I think this is accommodating this phenomena. So this is a challenge I think for city design. Can we kind of preempt these anticipatorily in a way that we bring them into the imagination of the city. In the same way as you showed us that beautiful project of water, uh, you know, the last, uh, the, the city where you've, uh, where the water is used or that, that landscape yeah. is used to filter the water. I mean, you need big scale gestures which embed these other imaginations that form a city. So it's one thing about retrofitting cities. So we can say, let's take Chicago and find spaces that we could reserve for this, and how do we work around land values and all of that. But, you know, the one thing, I'm sorry to go on, but this is related. Our imagination also is fixed for good reasons, like you showed us the hotspots. But if you look at the theorizing about cities, you look at, look at discussions about cities at universities, we are bloody fixated on the mega cities the, because the, there's a kind of perpetuation of knowledge construction around these. But I know the two of us have been looking at India, for example. The real urban time bomb India is sitting on are places that are 100, 200,000 people today where actually urban design and city planning, you can intervene because those possibilities, they're not yet locked into a paradigm. But the tyranny of images from the mega cities are propelling those small towns in a particular direction. And I mean, you know, there's wonderful work done in many parts of the way, where there's work done in uh, the desert quarter of the Indonesia, uh, Yes, Indonesia. I mean, there are places where there are scholars who are beginning to recognize there's another landscape that's emerging, and our energies as designers should actually go there. And I think, so there is a kind of concentration of the capital of knowledge in, in the area of urbanism that is sort of focusing so much on mega cities. It's compelling, it's, uh, but really I think if we have to save the planet for, for also the reasons that you outline, uh, city design, urban design programs, the university research has to, even in China, for example, the real urban time bombers in small towns. 
<clears throat> so that sort of leads where, where yeah. also it's not politically often so contested and yeah. even land yeah. is not so contested so you can do yeah. the kinds of things you're showing us that's why you could do what you were doing in those cities i've been spending a lot of time in knoxville over the last five years which is one of these smaller communities and uh, they have this sort of beautiful hierarchy of places uh, in the downtown which starts with the market square which used to be a building the building burned down and now it's just it's a public square uh, where all sorts of events happen it's like the living room for the city so every night something's usually going on weekends something is going on and then that translates into very active walkable streets and I, I do think with the American city framework, the grid from the uh, 19th century is really a gift because it, it creates this small increment and almost a, an equality between public space and private space. I think those fine grain grids are, have got to be almost 50% of the total land area. And so that, that scale, that framework allows uh, generational interventions, allows cities to change, and yet it keeps the structure familiar and, and rooted. The, the problem with that is it just can't go on forever. So you almost need a model of this kind of fine-grained grid to guide growth and then breaks where the larger ecological systems move through and then those those uh, structured communities begin again. And so you fragment this in a way, and then you connect it, of course, with mobility systems. But what we haven't done well is, is the breaks. We just let cities mm. go, and then we minimize the rivers, and then that's where you get in trouble with flooding, or you minimize the wetlands, or eliminate them, or you minimize the any of the sort of underlying ecologies. Yeah, no, I mean, just to put that another way, because that's, I believe, bang on, is we kind of design cities and then we make space for nature, in a sense, uh, versus designing the landscape and then actually yeah, using in the interstitial space, which comes out of the logic of ecology, is where we occupy it. So it, it, it needs a complete flip, in the, and that's why I think when architecture is instrumentalized so much in making city form, uh, we inv invariably get trapped in constructing the billscape first in our imagination and then making nature secondary. Yes. Um, uh, what role do you think universities can play in this, and especially public schools like us? Right? right. So this is um, committed to the ideals of public good and social justice, and we launching the city design program. How do you think that sort of fits? What you describe in 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 a place like? This? I mean, I think, well, well, first of all, I think, uh, and we talked about this a little yeah. before this event, I mean, I think, I think local engagement is very important because a lot of what we are describing can be abstracted and kind of made as traveling ideas, but a lot of it has to be felt and lived to understand a place. Uh, and I think that way of constructing knowledge through perception and experience, I think has to re-enter the pedagogy in some way if one has to bring the kind of sensitivity that Phil just sort of outlined. Uh, I think that's one. The other is, of course, these kinds of new questions uh, that we've, I think, both outlined and you've kind of highlighted need to find their way into the pedagogy. Uh, and I think to create true interdisciplinary work, uh, the problems have to be challenging and have to be big again in the way Phil described them. Because, you know, I think one of the problems, at least in my observation, is that in, in, in a lot of universities, interdisciplinary work is being celebrated. It's become the new kind of thing. Uh, and it's usually really tame. I mean, you know, I mean, getting a real estate student into a planning studio and, and landscape is just not enough. To create the true transgressions, you also need problems that make all the disciplines across the board feel totally challenged. And often that doesn't happen. And that doesn't happen 
because of accreditation requirements. It hadn't happened because of many other things. So one has to, I think, be strategic about that if one has to really, or we have to as pedagogues, really address the kinds of questions that were just outlined. Okay. Um, so Phil, I have a question for you. Remember that the, the topic of the conversation is the future of city design practice. What we've sort of seen is, and, and Forsyth argues it in our book on neighborhoods, that the interest in cities come in long cycles and goes away. For example, the last quarter of the 20th century, people didn't really care about cities much. Uh, whereas one could argue that in the post-war period, um, city planning and city design was sort of both. Uh, and given that we live in sort of in this urban moment, do you see this interest carrying on, or would it be, uh, as your slide showed, no future at all in a few years? Well, uh, I think it's an economic model, more, and, and the design component is a reaction to that. I think people are coming to cities because they're given an option of a better life, a better job, uh, there is cities that seem to be sources for better talent. So employer, employers like to be in urban settings. Uh, there are a lot of economic benefits to be in a city. The cross-fertilization of talent pools. Uh, so I think that uh, that's part of the reason this is happening. And uh, And then there is a sort of lifestyle choice that I think at first we saw it with younger generations wanting to live in a more vibrant urban setting, uh, retired people wanting to move back into a vibrant urban setting, and uh, the suburban communities sort of failing to meet those larger cultural demands. So I think culture and economics had a lot to do with it. But I, I think we're not going back. I think we're here to stay as city dwellers. I think North and South America in general have been uh, predominantly urban for a very long time. Uh, 75, 80% urban, I think, both South and North America. So we're, we're countries of city dwellers, uh, but so I don't think we're going back, but I, I do think that cities are becoming uh, cleaner, uh, less polluted, so they're healthier. Uh, but we have other issues. They're not affordable. I mean, affordability is a tremendous challenge to living in an urban environment. And uh, I think uh, what we're gonna see in Chicago, I think, will be really interesting. Like with this new mayor, we have a new mayor uh, starting in a month, uh, and I think the whole shift is going to be to bring neighborhoods up uh, that so desperately need investments. Don't you guys think that? I mean, I think this is going to be very cool to get involved in this broader view of Chicago and how to address the areas that have not come along with the success of downtown, for example. Uh, so how do we make cities affordable? How do we still provide good education so that families don't leave uh, for better schools? And how do we deal with the safety issues? Those are, those are ch real challenges we face. But, but on the whole, compared to 20 years ago, cities are offering to many people a much higher quality of life. Can I, yeah, so I mean, I just, just to extend something for the seven to go back to your question. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think the affordability is so critical because I mean, the other way to say that is also it's, they're becoming highly inequitable. And yes. there's also an upper limit to that in terms of their sustainability, uh, you know, and uh, uh, so that I think is one aspect. But the other aspect, because you were referring to Anne's book, yeah. um, is, and I know the question's been, been asked before, but I think in today's world, an example, I, I don't mean Uber and Lyft in this case, but <clears throat> with new technologies, the connectivity, I think even the question of what is urban and the, yeah. I mean, the urban rural binary is completely dissolved in some ways. And so, uh, and that's why I think the small towns 
and looking at other settlements becomes very important for universities, but for kind of uh, to imagine the future of cities because these, I mean, things that Phil just described about the grid breaking and nature and the upper limit of each, I mean, those might play themselves out. You might have new cities and the future of cities might not lie in the mega cities necessarily. It's right now incredibly obvious, but, um, you know, things change quickly. I think it's also at a regional scale, it's very challenging. We, we've gotten involved, I showed that one photo of the Sen River flooding and we, We've gotten involved uh, with regional planners in the Ile de France on this whole view of the Seine River watershed. And as we've been traveling through this, it's kind of shocking to me the, the smaller communities outside of Paris look, many of them look very destitute. Like there, there are no jobs, there is no industry. Uh, and uh, what do you do to a region where these smaller communities have lost that basis? Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you step back and look at the larger region, uh, just a whole set of issues present themselves. Yeah. The city itself is not affordable, right. but there are no jobs in the outer communities. By the way, can I just go back to your question to sure. Raul about, what universities can yeah, do. Yeah. I, I think universities are the, uh, the pa have the power to convene. And uh, this summit I was just at at Arizona State University was um, uh, set up to bring science and design together. And they're looking at subjects related to water and energy on all the cities between Los Angeles and Jacksonville, Florida on the I-10 corridor all of them pretty much in growth mode. And this was a university that took this on. This university decided all these cities are gonna participate and invited people from these cities to come. They hold these forums annually and then they do things throughout the year. But uh, I think uh, in Chicago, UIC could play a tremendous role in convening the world to talk about urban issues and use Chicago as as the the place to host it. So I, I think that's one of the powers you have. Which could happen in the university side. Yeah. All right. So um, one question from, from the student side to both of you. Many, many of our students come in uh, into our programs, both MAP and we believe MCD as well, hoping to change the world, right? They're eager to change the world. And then they sort of run into all of these issues. Um, and we know uh, cities <laughs> sort of straddle um, public policy, project finance, project conception. And both of you have sort of navigated this treacherous terrain over successful careers, right? 30 years, 30 plus years, different parts of the world, getting, conceiving these projects, getting them through, doing the political world. Um, so to use a millennial phrase, what's your MO? So to both of you. Phil, what's your MO? And then to Rahul, what's your MO? How do you, how do, you do this one? Uh, okay, you like to say you're doing this to change the world, but the likelihood that you're going to change the world is not that likely. But <laughs> you can inspire the world with your work. And your, your work can inspire people. And that's pretty good payment. That's pretty good reinforcement. If you feel you've inspired a community or you've brought a community together or you see a community getting railroaded because of some corrupt mayor and you step in and slow that down or steer it a different way, I mean, you start to inspire people and I think that's enough. Uh, but. In reality, you inspire yourself. If you're interested in, in uh, cities and urban design and urban planning and uh, a healthier future, then your work inspires you to keep going. And, and it's that simple, I think. Don't you think it's that simple? Um, you know, I think you, the metaphor I would use is like a game of golf, right? You're playing it against yourself. I hate right? golf. <laughs> <laughs> but the way you described it, right, that you, 
Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It's I never not, found golf in, <laughs> inspiring. Then That's you're not playing against play anyone else, but you 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 challenging your own handicap, right? And and sort yeah, of inspiring. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah. In that sense, um, you know. I didn't even know what MO meant, but anyway, now that you... I sort of didn't either, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I... <laughs> really, I mean, I think at the level of, of city design, uh, well, larger community settlements, it's really, it's, it's a diverse... Uh, I mean, I'm merely extending what Phil said. It's, 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 it's getting a diverse group of people I mean, cities are contested by nature, and how do you build coalitions around a question? Yeah. And, and how do you make visible and surface that clearly enough that people might band across that, uh, 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 with you on that? And so, you know, I mean, advocacy, of course, becomes, I mean, everything Phil described was advocacy, and I use this carefully because I know advocacy planning carries baggage, but advocacy in its sort of basic sense is, is what, but you know, I think you have to also think about what I call, or I describe as instruments of advocacy. So we often all feel compelled that we've got to become advocates. And there are sometimes things in life that don't permit you to do that. Uh, uh, you might be like someone like me, not fully connected with a community in a place where I'm now living. Uh, but you can contribute also as planners and city designers with constructing the instruments of advocacy, which might be uh, whether it's documentation, whether it's surfacing possibilities, uh, whether it's uh, creating this sort of kit of parts that might allow communities uh, to be, to use this possibility instrumentally. Uh, and so I think we have to sometimes separate advocacy and the instruments of advocacy, and sometimes Universities are better at constructing those instruments for advocacy, which then you create interfaces with, which is not to say universities can't become advocates too, but uh, sometimes separating it is useful for younger people because it allows you to expend your energy more strategically, perhaps. Okay. Uh, so uh, now to both of you, any, any concluding remarks before we open it for questions and, and discussion with the audience? No, I th I'd like to hear from the audience. Yes, no, no. Okay, all right. So at this point in time, we open it up for questions and, and comments, and uh, comments fee uh, phrased as questions, you know, uh, or questions phrased as comments. Question phrase as comments. Yeah.
time for Mumbai. It's created the, it's, it's, it's this massive problem because we, we create these plans and, we, and because of magic marker uh, or, or, or now uh, uh, the GIS systems, we can color in large areas or something. And we don't give any instructions to this. So this is where divergence happens. So you say this whole, and, and, and we say, well, this is all going to be residential. And how that, and that's in essence because we've enabled the creation of a development process that really thinks in, in, in single uses. So when the when the good developer says to me, I don't do, I only do housing, I don't do commercial. So you know that that's what's going to happen. So I come back here. The challenge that I think that we face. Uh, is, is how can we come back to, to the most conservative scale, which is a small scale, we don't have radical thinking, we don't have the community of conservative thinking, how can we work with them to be able to develop models uh, of integration rather than divergence uh, that can evolve and we can begin to point out over time to the to the other decision makers and other communities. So the challenge that I think that we, we have before us uh, is being able to articulate this in a fashion that the, the lay decision maker, the mayor, uh, can understand and also be able to exemplify this in places. And, and virtual reality on how loud is to take people all over. And I think if we as planners and architects come together rather than diverge, and as we think about issues of uh, being able to resolve issues at small scale that serve as models, we may be able to, to elicit from those sets of principles um, that can be used in an educational fashion to get to the doers and help them make good decisions. I mean, just to respond, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, but but we shouldn't we we should be cautious about also making that a linear process, which is to really say that both skills are simultaneously critical, uh, and so uh, often in planning and urban design we swing between these. You know, in the last ten years, acupuncture, urbanism, all of this has been really popular. Uh, but, you know, the regional plan also has huge value. Uh, uh, what happens is, and I think you alluded to, is, is the regional plan becomes too static and is not open to these feedback loops, then you begin to have problems. So I think the real challenge is to construct these feedback loops in dynamic ways between the small scale and the large. Uh, and, uh, and I think the technologies we have now in, at hand allow us to do that if we can structure the process uh, appropriately, uh, as, as you well kind of recognize. Because really the cities that I believe do the best are the ones that can actually simultaneously address both these scales. Um, and uh, you know, so I think the challenge is really how do you move between these scales. And I think bridge practices like city design or urban design in its classical form, that's why I called it a bridge practice, is about training a set of professionals that have the ability to think spatially at the small scale, but also the bandwidth to begin to engage with conversations across the region and create these kind of reiterative uh, feedback loops um, which, um, you know, which bridge these divergences that as you sort of pointed out, have uh, created these disjunctures in the process. Um, yeah, that's how, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not disagreeing, I'm just framing it differently. Yeah. There are some interesting, yes, just to talk about that a little further, uh, small scale interventions that uh, uh, could really shift the thinking in Chicago. Uh, and Woody, I don't know if you're leaving or not, are you staying? So Woody over there is from the Chicago Architecture Center, and they uh, funded this um, study called Rebel Alleys. I don't know if you guys have seen that or not, Rebel but garages. Rebel Garages, okay. But you need Rebel Alleys to get to the garages. <laughs> so how to sort of introduce mixed use into the garages on alleys uh, 
so that you suddenly have coffee houses and cafes and maybe you have uh, extra residential units above uh, and you start to transform the alley into a more active corridor and a city that's done that is Melbourne uh, where they took the alley system and uh, with Jan Gell's help and many others uh, now it is just the most amazing walkable city at where the alley has been redefined as these uh, sort of corridors of food. And uh, I think that we should continue to look at how to introduce new layers onto existing uh, urban frameworks to make them more dynamic, interesting, uh, valuable. Uh, and again, I think uh, if we could do that in cities, we might find uh, intervention solutions for affordability, and we might uh, not need to spread out into the greenfield sites. I mean, I, I think uh, if you look at all the vacant land in Chicago and the fact that it used to be, what, four million, how big was it before, four million people? 3.2, and now it's two. Oh, uh, well, yes, it's definitely an area that needs rethinking, and a lot of urban environments have zoning that's based on sort of 1957 era zoning that's still in place uh, when most cities laid out sort of zoning laws. Uh, I don't know sh the age of Chicago's zoning, but I know the downtown was rezoned in 2004, and it hadn't been rezoned before it since 1957 or something like that. But uh, the need to separate housing from industry isn't really there anymore with technology being the way it is. But there are other things that come into play. I think as you have higher density urban environments, you have other issues like noise. Has, noise is a really interesting challenge to urban dwellers now. Uh, that, uh, but I, I think you could, you could definitely research the subject of zoning and find where more flexible zoning maybe produces uh, stronger sort of economic incentives, uh, healthier urban environments, more investments. Uh, it'd be interesting to, to research that. Oh, Paula. Oh. <laughs>
hesitation around when we put public or something. Like public libraries, yes. Public parks, very good. Public schools, uh, public um, housing, we're getting rid of that. So it seems to be a, a relationship with that value that is not going in the direction that will make room for all this investment where it needs to happen. Um, I know it's a loaded question, but I, for me it's a crisis of the value of investing in the public. And it might be a, a need for redefining what does that mean. How do you do that in a word? Oh, oh, does that have any value? I, I mean, I do think something's seriously broken when cities don't seem to be able to find the funding for supporting, as you say, the, pu the public infrastructure. Uh, and you could add public transit to that too. You didn't mention public transit, but uh, the closing of uh, the 50 schools in Chicago, I, I don't know too many uh, cultures that a bit walk away from such expensive infrastructure that they invested in to just sort of walk away from those. Uh, why is it cities can't afford to upgrade their uh, public transit systems? I mean, why are these expenses beyond the ability of a city? No. Is it the priorities of the city? We should really ask Steve. Well, I would add to your list uh, streets. Streets, sure. Cities ought to own and maintain streets. But we are, in fact, in the suburbs, we do not even want to, cities and villages do not even want to own streets. They do not want to maintain streets. They would sort of maybe like them to be built to their standards, but they're not even sure about that. Um, but you can flip that same issue to big cities. The two very controversial projects that are moving through the system right now are all about building basically streets and other infrastructure, and that the public will ultimately pay for about two thirds of it, and the developers will pay for all, advance all of it, and then get re reimbursed for perhaps two thirds of it. If you take the redevelopment agreements, which are before the city council and are on file and you just look at the basic map, each one has a table in the back of what the developer is being reimbursed for, you probably have to pair it with another document to get the total infrastructure cost. But the city, this city, is having a hard time building that infrastructure on sites that have no infrastructure. They have no usable urban infrastructure. So the problem is, exists throughout, um, and the value stress that you're talking about having lost the notion of what is public and what should rightly be public. Um, I've often described myself as a 1950s Republican conservative. I think cities ought to build and own the streets. They also ought to decide what the urban structure is and perhaps find a way to finance the spines of the urban structure so that the grid can in fact expand and continue. But we are in a crisis of values over it because you could afford it if you wish to. I think the overlapping problem with both of these is that we have a, I would go as far as to say incompetent city council around these types of urban issues. Um, I, I just took a run for city council um, and I fell short about 200 votes. And so often people said, well, Casey, you're not an attorney. You know, your uncle wasn't a state representative. <laughs> Who gives a shit? I studied urban planning. It's like, it's uh, I, I gave this example. Like it's tax season. I go to an accountant to do my taxes. Um, pretty soon I'm going to need some work done in my apartment, so I'm going to go to a carpenter. Um, but the people that we put in charge to manage our city know nothing about city management. Um, and so, as you were talking about interdisciplinary stuff in the program that you're developing, um, is there is there a plan in place to pull students that are because it's way too late to teach something in city council now. When I interned for a city council member, she thought I was brilliant because I could talk about economic development. I said, I'm an undergrad. I, I read a book on this. It's called Jane <laughs> Jacobs. Um, um, I, 
now are you guys, are you all going to be making a conscious effort because you got to start your farm team early. You need to pull students who are studying politics and pull them as early as you can to start thinking about urban planning, uh, particularly on economic development, equity with housing and education. Um, is that a part of the plan in, in the new program that you're developing? Um, and, and how aggressive would you be? Because you got it. Yeah. No, that would be more of an undergraduate, right? We have an no. undergraduate program. No, that's too late for that, too. Where this has to be is in C. You see, we've lost the notion of teaching civics. Hold on, so, so that's a no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a city design program, right? So it's more spatial, physical design. Understood. Yeah. What, yeah. You're what you're asking is an educated public. And in order to do asking a lot. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I not asking this. a lot. And, and if you look at, 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 the, at the high school system, they don't teach civics anymore. Many high school systems have, have removed civics as, as, as part of the curriculum. I often thought that if you run for, if you're run for office, you've got to pass the test. <laughs> I don't know what the is going to work. But that's, a, it, and that's an important point. I think it's, it's kind of outside the context of, yes. of our discussion. Well, okay. the there are resources. So you, you, the Urban Land Institute has a program called Urban Plan, yeah. which they do in, uh, in schools, and they also have a version of Urban Plan for Public Petition, okay. which is used. And it's really remarkable. It uses plain old Duplo-sized Lego blocks mm -hmm. to mass the city. And it's remarkable to watch the public officials suddenly become greedy, voracious developers. <laughs> <laughs> and understand, begin to understand the problem. So there are tools, and it's just it's uh, it's uh, an effort to uh, attack them. Uh, actually, the Urban Land District Council currently is I don't think is doing urban plan in this region. All right, that's an excellent yes, Zeri. indebted to him. Uh, for those of you who know, for the last 10 years I left Skidmore and I started literally a grassroots uh, small group. Uh, I wanted to actually do all the things we talk about and see how we could implement that. So for my and I've also touched on that for for 10 years. I think I have a very different take on all the issues that we're talking about. I think the planning profession forever has talked about Course, advocacy, all the issues, we blame the zoning, we blame the politicians. And I always think, you don't go to a dentist and ask the dentist, can you do a public forum to tell me what's wrong with my tooth? <laughs> we as a profession don't have concrete answers. We're continually blaming others, where we really, of course our city council members should know about, about our planning. But who has time? Do they know, or know enough about law or any other professions? It's our job as a profession, first and foremost, to find credible solutions. And we don't do that. And all the issues we all raise, of course, but in 10 years, I have been stunned to find from the most uh, uneducated people in the French suburbs to be working in the city as well, that the climate has changed. People are, the fight is actually easier. You know, we have changed zoning to make it more flexible. Everything you are all talking about on the ground, we are actually doing. And what the biggest challenge is to find actually consultants who have the skills to deliver, to have the research that we don't have the time to have to do the research, that the research is available to us. So I would say the fight since the post-war era that this profession has fought is changing. Our students don't need to fight that fight anymore. We need programs like this to give them tangible, I mean, to have a question like, is there anyone doing zoning research? Of course there is. We should have the answers. We should have standardized rules. If you look at the AICP exam, it tests you on nothing. This is why we as a profession are not taken seriously. That architectural, you know, education is different. So there's so many issues, but I think the future is a bit more positive. Is it, it is a far more rosier than everything from a public street, the, the emphasis on public. I would say the fight is easier now, so we can't keep saying, you know, it's, we need to keep fighting. 
we need far more technical, tangible, well-researched answers. Mm -hmm. So the next generation is really so, yeah. solving well, problems. And that's the reason I separated advocacy and the instruments for advocacy, right. because what you're describing are the instruments for advocacy, Absolutely. which comes out more naturally from a university. And it's easier, really, for younger people, because that's their expertise. That's their core expertise. And so really, in, if society has to take us seriously, I'm actually just reframing, in a sense, what you've said very beautifully. No, 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 is that soci if society has to take us seriously, because society invests in us to imagine spatial possibilities in cities. So that's what we should focus on, correct? I mean, that's the dentist uh, example was exactly that. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I think that really is our core mission, which we have to strengthen first, and it'll make us more kind of uh, yeah, effective, I think. That's about MO. So um, the technology, the knowledge base that Maria is talking about mm -hmm. works in, in, I believe, in, in an MO that has as its participants all of the stakeholders, all those who have a legitimate interest in the matter at hand, and all of the disciplines that are relevant to that problem. Um, and then you work a process around that. And eventually somebody has to make decisions if anything's going to happen. But you work a process that engages in many different kinds of processes, but to engage all of those people in the process. And that's how you can, I think, get to outcomes that lead to um, things that change the built environment, or change things that change the uh, rules and zoning in a, in, a, in a community. The problem is, if you do it at a city, at the scale of a city like Chicago, it's virtually impossible. We used to do some of it at the neighborhood scale, and the, the planning out program in the city, and we do it in suburbs. But it, it, it requires a lot of uh, time and effort in addition to the hard analysis and research it requires you to spend time in a process that has all of the disciplines and all of the stakeholders in the room together to work with. That's, that's the MO that we use when we can. Um, oh, but thanks, Zareen, yeah. for bringing this back on sort of the future of city design practice at the retail level, uh, right. where, you know, uh, with some of these ideas sort of pan out very well. Yeah. Yes.
program, University of Massachusetts Amherst, mm -hmm. the planning um, and landscape architecture mm -hmm. program there has a really yeah. interesting yeah. collaborative so, so, so design so effort that they do with continuous soil, which is more industrial. Um, and they embed it. They have a storefront presence there in the community, and they have a really um, grassroots engaged uh, design process to build that community. And they've done some really good work. And New Vine has done that down in Campaign with the East St. Louis Action Project. I don't know that much about that program, too. But um, I think those are the kinds of actions that you can do. And I think that there are some um, public agencies that are doing that really well. So I was just in Austin, and the transit agency there opened the storefront so that the CEO could go and meet with the public and engage and talk about their design projects and what they want to accomplish. And then I think there, there are ways that we as planners can, can help people bridge that. So we, we want to be winding down now, but before that, uh, I want to give you a last shot at concluding or responding or tying together some of these ideas that came up. Uh, thank you for in, inviting me. I appreciate it. And I think the, the conversation is really great. I think all these points are <coughs> important. The subject is broad and complex and multi-layered. And so you've, you've got to have a forum to have these kinds of conversations. I love the storefront idea. A number of cities have these storefront idea, storefront places for city talks, uh, bringing people together. And I think you could benefit from that too because uh, we're in a basement here and no one outside even knows <laughs> this exists. So maybe in addition to this space you get a storefront in a neighborhood. Uh, might be a great idea. But thank you for coming. Yeah, no, this is uh, it's fantastic to also see something starting with all the hope and uh, hopefully transformative pause. But I just want to make one comment starting from your, your comment on values and the devolving of planning from the public in that sense as happened in America, but also the comments I think that uh, you raised. And it just made me think that I think one of the challenges for pedagogy and for the university in training you know, professionals who would uh, be change makers, let's say, or be effective on the ground and be able to straddle questions of values is, is also a very fundamental question which we don't take very seriously when we train architects or planners or urban designers is forms of clientele or patronage. What does that mean? Uh, it's very singular. Uh, I already, when I talk about architecture, I begin to actually break the client and unpack it and I always see it as a patron an operational client and a user. So let's say we're doing a library for the School of Architecture, which we just recently did. The patron is, you know, the the trustee of the trust that can, that has initiated the project. The operational client are the building committee, and the users are uh, actually the kids who are going to use the library. Uh, we often collapse it into one and are frustrated because. We are often dealing with the operational client who has another set of values, but if you can actually create feedback loops between this unpacked form of the client, you begin to become very effective. And I can do a whole lecture on that one experience that really made a project that was almost doomed to fail happen. And I think in planning urban design and listening to all the, the four last comments, I was couldn't but help think about that, is how can pedagogy uh, prepare students for a much more diverse reading of what your client is. Who are you actually serving? So it's not about them just gathering the cloud, crowd, but for example, today in India, as you were mentioning Mexico too, civil society is becoming very important as a patron because they're the ones who are, because I mean, at least my understanding of civil society is folks who can connect with both the grassroots but have the bandwidth to also engage with more powerful forces. Uh, and that's what civil society does. And actually for planners, that's a great constituency to connect with uh, because they begin to make that connection. So as an uh, architect or a planner coming out of school, it's gonna take me a decade to make that bridge. But I can actually connect with civil society as you were describing with very specific tools and 
very specific instruments that help them create those forms of advocacy. And so I think uh, understanding who we are serving and what is the moment that we can make that interface, whether it's a self-initiated uh, initiative or whether it's connecting with civil society that has already invested in that formation, becomes also very critical in the way as professionals we can engage with the world outside. Thanks, Rahul. So at this point in time, I'd like to invite uh, the dean of the college, um, uh, Dr. Mike Pagano, to, for a vote of thanks uh, and to conclude this event. Thank you, and thank you, Rahul Mahodra and Phil Enquist for the presentation today. But before we dismiss to have some uh, snacks over here, I don't want to uh, miss the opportunity to make a couple of uh, observations. First, I don't enter into a debate that I don't understand. So when you talk about what you are doing in city design, uh, I say uh, what we talk about, whether cities are well managed or where they know about management, it reminds me that this is a college of urban planning and public affairs. There is a master's in public administration, which is one of the top ranked programs yes. in the country. That part of it and our part of it in urban planning, maybe I think the call is for a little better integration and overlap the conversations with each other. So we do have an outstanding faculty and, uh, and staff over there in, in public administration. Second is, the state of Illinois did one smart thing in the last few years. Civics is now a required course. In <laughs> so starting, I think it was last year, it was the first year that uh, students from That's Illinois cool. high schools to That's receive the diploma from the state have to have completed, I think it's just one semester, but at least it's a civics class, so maybe we'll have real conversations in the future. And finally, uh, the area that I do speak highly of, or speak to, is finance. There's a conference on Friday at the Federal Reserve Bank and about financing infrastructure of the future, uh, which I'll be speaking at. But so, uh, other than those three observations, there's nothing else I'll add except to join me. The college is supporting these events to kick off the uh, City Design Master's pro uh, Program. It will begin in the fall. Uh, and we have another speaker, Michael Batty, will be here May 1st at what time? 2 to 4, 2 to 4 p.m. Michael Batting will be here speaking on the, uh, the title of this book is The Future of City, but he's changed this one to The Future of City. Inventing. Uh, I'm sorry, Inventing the Future's uh, Future City. Anyhow, uh, be sure to come back to that on May 1st uh, at from 2 to 4 here also, right? Great. Thank you. There are snacks over here. Thanks to our panelists and to Sanji for putting this together. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that was fun. Yeah, he had a good conversation. I'm glad. You got some people in there? Oh, that's all the day.